The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. This is Sandra Nicholson with the Nebraska Association of Local Health Department Directors. Sorry, I just had a blank. Um, and today I am so excited to um, be here with you and um, to talk about vision and eye health and the connection between public health. Um, and today, I just want to give a little few, um, a few housekeeping items at this point. Um, you can see on the screen there, since this is a webinar, all of you are muted. If you do have a question, you can either raise your hand and I can unmute you, or you can use your chat box and I'll be um, watching the questions, uh, question box as they come in, and I can relay your question for you. Um, and I just wanted to give thanks also uh, to our sponsors today. Uh, let's see. Um, we, the Nebraska Association of Local Health Directors received a small, a small grant from the Department of Health and Human Services and the Public Health, um, Health Promotion Unit Injury Prevention Program to really assess what type of vision or eye health related activities um, are going on across the state in our local health departments. Um, and from that, too, we just wanted to bring awareness um, around the connection between vision and eye health and public health. Um, so thank you to um, DHHS for um, th helping us put this on today. Um, without further ado, I think I'm going to go ahead and um, start um, introducing our presenter. And as I'm doing that, I'm multitasking. I'm going to pass the controls over to her. Um, I'm happy to announce that um, we have Dr. Lori Grover with us and also Dave McBride. And I'll introduce them um, separately here in just a second. But Dr. Grover is Senior Vice President for Health Policy and a Chief Compliance Officer at King Devic Technologies. I incorporated in Oakbrook, Illinois, and I'm so sorry I sound like a robot right now. Um, she leads organizational initiatives that increase access to evidence-based policies and protocols for improving population health outcomes. Dr. Grover earned her Doctor of Optometry degree from the Illinois College of Optometry and received her PhD in Health Services Research and Policy from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she also earned certificates in Public Health Economics and Public Health Informatics. Um, a, kind of in the background, we have Dave McBride. He's the executive director of the Nebraska Optomic, Optometric Association, and he is here today to help us um, make that connection between local resources and public health. So without further ado, Lori, I think I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me fine, Sandra? Make sure that I've got the screen up. Everything look good? Yes, um, I hear you fine. Just and I see your screen, so I think we're okay. good to go. So I just realized with this laptop that the controls are very sensitive. So in case I jump ahead, excuse my uh, my improper touching on these little keys because they're kind of small. But thank you, everyone, uh, for having me. And I want to especially thank you, Sandra and, and Jason, for inviting me to talk. Um, this is really great. I invite people to um, interact as we go through. If you have any questions, um, I cut the slides down a little bit from an earlier presentation that was at the um, at the I summit a few weeks ago. Um, and I do have a fair amount of clinical information, but I'll try and breeze through that so we can have a little bit more of a focus on um, the public health concepts and point out some of the more public health related um, information, especially from the NASM report. So just two things. My my clinical background is in chronic vision impairment and rehabilitation. So that's what I've specialized in from the eye care perspective uh, for a long time. And I'm at the end of the road. So anybody that has a permanent vision impairment or um, anything that caused a chronic impairment, they see me. And um, I would love for us to realize that I'm the end of the road. And really what we're talking about here is at the very front of the road, um, very much the upstream, the most upstream part of what we can do to help promote eye health and improve population health. So um, with that being said, I'm gonna see if we can go forward. So um, we focused a lot on children's vision because of early intervention, because of, of problems that we can prevent when children are very young. 
um, even before a year of age, um, there's a lot of, of, of care that we can provide that prevents um, the long-term effects of vision loss. So I wanna go over a little bit of that with you and give you some of the current evidence. I wanna talk about what some of the recommendations are that we can look at from a collaborative standpoint, and then also give you data, resources, and information that you can share um, working um, across the stakeholders that you serve, as well as the populations that, that we all target. And we do have a lot of overlap in that regard. So um, when we look at the evidence that supports what we do, as in healthcare, as in with anything we do, we want to make sure that we look at it with a critical eye and that we understand what we know, what we don't know, and where the gaps are. So I want to spend just a few minutes reviewing um, some of the information about where we come from as doctors of optometry. Um, doctors of optometry are integral as primary eye care providers. So we have what's a PCP in the quote unquote medical care arena or the house of medicine, your primary care provider, family physician, pediatrician, sometimes internal medicine. From the eye care perspective, the optometrists um, are the predominant primary eye care providers in the country. And we take um, prevention and preventive and primary care very seriously. Some of uh, recent data findings that we have from one of our programs, which is called Think About Your Eyes, um, is listed in that infographic on the right side of the screen. But I wanted to highlight that there's a lot of misperception and a lot of um, misunderstanding about how important it is um, in looking at the eyes and the visual system. So we know that 80% of everything that a child learns is through the visual system. We know that six out of 10 kids are identified um, as having undetected vision problems who are considered problem learners. There's a lot of vision uh, issue involved with learning and behavior. And what we know is that the primary stakeholders for kids, the parents and the folks that are taking care of the healthcare needs of these kids don't really understand that eye care is a critical part of their healthy checkup and their care follow-up. So there's some interesting findings about, um, you know, 86% of people have taken their car in for routine maintenance, which is twice as many as have taken their kids in to, to have an eye exam. So there's a lot of inequity. There's a lot of um, healthcare inequity in, health, in eye care. And I think that that's something we take as optometrists very seriously. Our professions and our groups are, have been working diligently to kind of raise that awareness. Um, the thing that has really been helpful in the last few years has been this report that was generated by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. This was the first a roadmap for the nation that had come out that talks about how to make eye health a population health imperative. And I was lucky enough to be part of the committee that was appointed to look at this issue. And then we spent two years um, gathering information and doing the, the, the work to provide the study content. And this is available online. Uh, I think if you wanna buy the book, you have to buy the book, but there are some good summaries of it and a lot of articles and information that has been shared on that. And I, and I think it's important to remember that the National Academies is, it's, it, used to, it was the Institute of Medicine when I started, but they changed the Institute of Medicine now to become the National Academy of Medicine as part of the National Academies. So um, this is a very vocal, well-respected, hallowed part of the national healthcare scene and um, a good mouthpiece and voice for what we need to do. And it was sponsored by a bunch of good stakeholders. So there was a lot of crossover, a lot of involvement from folks that care, at least, you know, we, we all care about um, making, making health in the United States better and improving health outcomes. And this is just a list of the people that sponsored that report. So just as a quick background on it, the charge that we were given was to look at core principles and public health strategies to promote eye health and reduce vision impairment in the country. And so this, re this project started off as about a four, a projected four chapter report that could be done within a year. And we found out very soon into the task that it took much longer and became a nine chapter book, which had doubled the length and the size of it. 
some of the really key public health pieces and some of the things you'll appreciate as public health professionals have to do with how we conceptualize not only the clinical cont continuum of eye and vision care, but how eye and vision health fits into the public health continuum, the greater health picture, you know, that mountaintop view of health. And I wanted to share a couple of these so that you can um, use them not only for reference, but also for dissemination. But, you know, the, the, the chain of, of upstream to downstream eye and vision health, there's great graphic and information in there. A lot of you recognize this, the po population health approach. So this is an adaptation of the wheel or the, the pie or the, you know, whatever you call your, that little, you know, the little diagram that we all know and love from public health. And we tried to embed um, not only assessment, policy development, assurance and evidence and research into everything, but to show you how this cuts through all the way from preventive and primary through secondary and tertiary care. So in my clinical world, I focus a lot in the tertiary world. However, um, I think we all have a hand in the preventive or primordial side as well as the primary side. So there were a summary of nine recommendations that came out of this report. Um, it was a consensus study that was grounded in a lot of very strong evidence. And there's thousands of references in this document. And I would encourage all of you to take a look at that because there's, it's a great compilation of what we have. It also does a great job of compiling what we don't have. And one of the areas where I think you can also draw information from for your strategic planning and your, and your evidence-based public health outreach is looking at evidence-based clinical care guidelines. And I have also been fortunate enough to work on been almost six years that I've worked with the evidence-based optometry committee for the AOA and the American Optometric Association has published publicly available um, multi-target uh, multi audience targeted uh, evidence-based clinical practice guidelines and these are available online free of charge you can go in and download the PDFs the adult eye and vision exam and the comprehensive pediatric eye and vision exam are the two more recent ones that really can address those primary and preventive strategies. There's also a lot of great information in the diabetes guideline, which is older. However, that guideline is now in a current, we're, we're finalizing a revision. So in the next year, you'll probably see a new update on that. Um, the Guidelines really combine the best available national scientific evidence that we have in, with research and um, expert opinion, and we follow a very strict Institute of Medicine process to develop the guideline. This is our process. Um, this gives you an idea of, of why it takes us a while to generate these guidelines, a, a, a minimum of a year. It was two years to do the first diabetes guideline. Um, I think it's important because this evidence helps you when you're looking at potentially changing, modifying, embellishing, and enhancing things like state administrative code. And, and I'm gonna call on Dave to kind of interject anything he wants to along this, this line um, as we go along, Dave McBride from the Nebraska Optometric Association. But it's really important because when you're writing in your regulatory and your legislative language, what you want to do and where you want to go, you need to know what the evidence tells us so that we know we're going to affect the best um, public health and clinical health outcomes. So um, this is just a review of what you have in Nebraska. And this is a review of the administrative code that's in Nebraska. So this basically says a visual evaluation, which is not necessarily distinctly defined, but it does say when, and it does say by who. So you actually are one of the states that has it written in, in statute or in code you know, to do this. Um, so I wanted to share that with those of you in public health so that you know um, that there has been a lot of progress made in Nebraska because of Dave and folks like him who have advocated for that. But here's the challenge that we have is that this is an example of what we think of as a primary care physical examination. So when you go in, for a full systems workup, when you go in for your quote unquote physical, this is a great representative slide that kind of shows you what you kind of have to look at if you're going to make sure you cover all your bases. And in 
in the big circle, the big red circle. Now, in the smaller red circle is a summary of what our physician friends in primary care look, would consider a screening or an examination sequence for the eyes. And this is just how they interpret an eye exam and what would be an effective, they define it as an effective screening physical exam. So if you think about just the eyes and the visual system, there's a lot of different component pieces that they highlight. And the challenge here is we know that the evidence tells us that there's not one way to address effectively evaluating the eyes and the visual system without examination. And I wanna show you why we know that. So, and why it's important that we talk about that. There's a lot of data and this, again, a lot of this comes from the NASM report, but a lot of it is out there in other arenas as well, that one in five children has a vision problem. And we have lots and lots of evidence to show what those disorders are. We have lots of evidence to show that it affects normal development, adversely affects school performance, social interactions, and also self-esteem. We also know, and this is a little shout out for my area because a lot of 60% of, of my patient population are, are not children, um, but a good chunk of them are, that any vision disorder or condition that we can't address and effectively treat in childhood will continue on through long, long life. And there are tremendous negative impacts of chronic vision impairment and vision loss. And, um, detrimental impacts, uh, impacts on um, the individual, on societal, um, economics, and vocational outcomes, hospitalization, mortality, morbidity, there's just all sorts of public health and, and health-related consequences of vision loss. So the whole concept of eye and vision screening is, I think, a real crux of the discussion issue because it's not well-defined, we don't have a lot of evidence, for it and it's all over the board. And I wanna spend a few minutes kind of showing you where the challenges are when we try to think about the best way to attack eye and vision health as a public health issue. So there's a lack, an overall lack of strength of evidence in screening techniques as they stand. Standardization, reliability, specificity, targeting, all these things are lacking. We have no universally accepted definitions recognized anywhere with regards to what vision screening is. So what the lions do versus what eye doctors do versus what the bus from Head Start does versus what some other entity does are usually very different and, and not well aligned. So the mantra that I always live by is you have to define what one means when they say the word screen. And a big challenge that we find in eye care, especially as doctors of optometry, is when the term screening is inaccurately and inappropriately conflated with eye care. So eye care meaning screening. So think of that slide we just saw from, from physical um, examination. You know, a, a screening physical is not necessarily an accurate term because you're having a physical examination. Same thing goes with eye care, and eye screening is not the same as an eye examination, but unfortunately, there's a lot of overlap in how people perceive that concept. So we know that there's a lack of evidence for screening, and we've been told that recently by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, who makes most of our recommendations for quality um, screening and care and health care. The only screening recommendation that USPSTF has made is very specific. It's in children three to five years to detect amblyopia. That's it. So it's a narrow population. It's a very narrow age range and it's one condition, amblyopia, which is where you have one eye that doesn't have the image coming in and focus. The visual system doesn't develop properly. It's a big problem because it does lead to a lot of um, irreversible vision impairment if not caught early on. There is a lack of screening for, in the nation for anything else. There's a lack of evidence for any other type of screening in the United States, including that for adults. So the fact that you see people advocating for screening doesn't align with what we know from the standpoint or what we should be addressing as a true population health screen. 
The USPS has also concluded that there's not enough evidence to assess the benefit or the harms of screening for kids who are three and younger, and that's a really great and important population to target. Here's one of the issues we have, and this is where I think in the next five to 10 years, we'll hopefully see some progress. There was never any comparison done from the USPSTF standpoint that looked at vision screening compared to eye examination. And that's a challenge that we have is to understand, we all understand what the benefits of eye exam are, but right now we know screening doesn't work and we probably would know more about why it isn't effective if we could compare it to eye examination. So we talked about the one recommendation made for screening, which defines three to five kids for amblyopia. But most of the screening that's historically been done has focused on visual acuity or how well can somebody see a target far away. And it's an important metric. It's certainly something we take seriously, but it doesn't give us any indication about how well the eyes work, work together. Do they see up close? Um, is the visual system functioning? Can we process information? Are there issues with um, the visual perceptual component of the visual system, and it leaves out all important health-related ocular factors. So the other reason, the other issues that we have with screening is that there is no recommended protocol with regards to the type of equipment used, how the equipment is maintained, how results are interpreted, who is providing this quote, quote unquote screening, how are they trained, what's the background, and things like environmental lighting and things like that all affect the results of information you will see or you will have to interpret. So there's a lot of ambiguity and there's a lot of issues related to are we targeting an appropriate population and are we targeting the outcomes we want to find in that population based on screening. So the, the, the thing to take home out of all that is there's not one single test, assessment, or procedure that rules in or out a healthy visual system. We know that. Hopefully I've made that case. And there's a lot of negative downstream factors that affect what we do. Now my, my public health area of interest is in health services research and health policy. So I'm always looking at secondary data sets and I'm looking at information that helps me understand how to make healthcare more accessible and, and make healthcare um, more effectively delivered. But anything that we measure at the front end you know, garbage in, garbage out sometimes, we run into the situation of not being able to even analyze that data appropriately. So systematic reviews and meta-analyses sometimes are very challenging because of limitations in what data we gather and how these eye health related problems um, are interpreted, not only in research, but in definitions of, of surveys and et cetera. So I wanted to share that as well. So, we know all of us from the public health perspective know what an effective screening must do. It has to represent target health outcomes and properly assess how they're distributed. So without us having clear metrics, we, we have a challenge in that regard. And unfortunately, we do have challenges in that regard with, in, in eye care. Some important information that helps, um, that kind of helped get us to this point has come out of places like New York, a lot of school age studies that have been done. When we look at visual acuity at distance alone, um, we found out that 75% um, of these kids were missed with having other visual problems and that 41% of kids who failed the state screening wouldn't even have been identified if it had been on visual acuity alone. So there are, and I've, I've studied data from Maryland when I was um, at Hopkins where the school-based screening failed in very similar uh, fashion. So the percentages are not good. However, we continue to push screening without having good sensitivity and specificity. I'm not gonna spend any time on this because all of you understand this. I did this for the folks in the audience before who we wanted to make a reminder of what, what those two values are because they're very important. Um, I wanna share with you that the VIP study, which was a longitudinal study that did a really good job of looking at if, if we were to develop a screening protocol, what would it be and how could we get there? And this was done 90s into the 2000s. Um, they looked at 11 different vision screening techniques. So this was an analysis of kind of what was going on out there in the country. And they found that um, there were specificities ranging from 62 to 
and detection was 16 to 64, so it wasn't good. And here's just some specific data from their, um, their multiple papers that are out there. Some of the more common instrument and, um, and handheld equipment-based screens were not even above 51, 52% sensitivity, and that's, that's not good. I don't think any of us would find that acceptable for a recommended test. So visual acuity, 49, the HOTV, 36, MTI photo screener, 37, retina max, sure sight, 51, 52. So we're seeing that if we're, if we're going to address a screen, a vision screen, we don't even really have an effective way of getting to a high level of sensitivity. The other thing that we have to think about is this confluence of state laws requiring eye examinations, what the schools want to do with regards to school-based uh, eye care and vision programs, and the historical part of screening, which involves school nurses, and then there's a big historical com component from optometry involved with Head Start, where we come out and actually do eye exams called screenings, which is sometimes defined inappropriately, but yet kids are getting eye exams in certain parts um, of the country, if the van comes out to get an eye exam, like you have starting up in Nebraska with the new um, with the new bus coming to the schools, that's actually comprehensive eye care, and that's a great thing. So if we could build school-based eye care in, that would be a great way to address some of the issues. Um, but I wanted to share with you that there are states that recommend um, that have that have strong recommendations and have built into their language recommendations for eye exams prior to starting school, which is a great a great start and Kentucky was one of the first states to do that. So revisiting our Nebraska code, you have language that says, yeah, we value this and we know that this is helpful from the state perspective, but are we being specific enough? Is do are we are we incorporating the latest and greatest evidence to make sure that we're providing and addressing the issue um, care for those health issues we need to address? The thing that really, uh, and it see, is just as of yesterday, is, is again under fire are the essential health benefits um, through, the, um, through the ACA. And the essential health benefits, for those of you that may not know this, part of the ACA mandated certain health benefits for populations, and one of them was mandating eye examination for um, all children who are under 18 as a mandatory part of their health plan as a covered benefit. This is under attack currently back and forth in the current administration, so we keep an eye on this, but this is important because it not only provides the eye care, but it also provides treatment options that include glasses and contact lenses, which is one of the primary ways that we can help to improve um, the eye and vision health of a lot of kids. Um, the NASM report also reinforces this by calling out eye exams as the gold standard to most accurately identify and diagnose eye problems. So we've got a lot of information out there supporting pushing for comprehensive eye care. The challenge is how do we get it embedded? Um, and it's not just optometry talking this. This is also the Academy of Ophthalmology. Now I put a little bit of information in there about what they say and it's all on their website. The National Association of School Nurses, they're a little more specific, but they do talk about eye exams for medical or develop, developmental risk. However, I think we can be much broader with that, with the evidence we have regarding primary and preventive care. Um, National Center for Children's Vision and Prevent Blindness, they also have very specific recommendations for eye, eye examinations by eye professionals. And the Academy of Optometry is another group that's very specific. So um, the Centers for Disease Control have called this out for years. They are very, um, lots of data, lots of evidence to show that comprehensive pediatric eye exams are essential. And they also have evidence for adults as well. And then the National Eye Institute. And the National Eye Institute basically says, look, eye examination is a foundation for good health. And they have supported not only through the NEHAP program, but in other arenas, um, the ways to reach out in multilingual and culturally appropriate communications and information and health literacy in a lot of areas um, that they've done a great job at, at trying to help embed a better message for the United States. So I just want to take another few minutes to review with you the strategies that I kind of summarized all of these results of this report from NASM and give you a little bit of where do we go from here? How can we address some of 
this data? How can we move things forward and how can we improve upon what we already have? So there are, were five foundational strategies that emerged from this report. The first one was that as a nation, we need to facilitate better public awareness with good access to good information, locally relevant, you know, that it that it embeds not only from you know local and regionally, but it, it translates that national evidence into local action. We need to generate more evidence. There's a lot of gaps out there, especially in the area of screening with regards to needing more evidence so that we can make better policy decisions and better evidence-based actions. That there is readily available clinical care available, but we just need to make sure people get better access. And access is one of the areas that I studied when I was working on my PhD to care is a big big area for me. So we have available access, so we have potential access, we have readily available eye care. The problem that we see is in the second part of access, which is in utilization or uptake of care. So the focus really, at an, at a, at if you're gonna provide an intervention, it's how do we increase uptake and utilization of readily available eye care? That to me, I think is the crux of that whole continuum of eye care right now. Um, we need to help enhance public health capacities that can support activities related to vision. And I think this is a great example of that. And then promote community actions that encourage healthy environments for the eyes and the visual system. So to run through these five real quick, there's um, a vision health initiative, which I'm a representative uh, member of uh, to the CDC. They're working on developing a strategic plan that kind of piggybacks onto the National Academies report. Hopefully, it will also become another avenue of important reference information and calls to action and support for um, what people do in areas such as you and, and NALHD in different states. There's the Think About Your Eyes campaign, which I don't know if you've seen it, but I want you to be aware of the fact that this is something that the, the Doctors of Optometry and the American Optometric Association have put a ton of, ref, of resources into in the last decade. Um, um, the National Awareness Campaign formally kicked off in 13, but we had different versions of this earlier on. Kansas had a state version. I think most states, Dave could tell you, Nebraska had a version of trying to increase awareness, and it's, it's now a, a, a unified national um, project. Uh, the CDC has been charged, we recommended in the NASM report, to develop a national coordinated surveillance system and have HHS develop a common research agenda now. You know, we can't get everything going, but it sure would be great if all of our stakeholders who are involved in these different areas grabbed a hold of these things and, and moved on and helped us to develop and address some of those calls for action. Um, we've developed a registry to help us gather data, to look at outcomes, to help our professional group understand where they're benchmarked with their peers and get more PQRS and meaningful use data and criteria out there so we can help to affect change with national quality metrics for USPSTF and other areas. Um, again, expanding access to appropriate clinical care. How do we increase utilization and uptake of what's out there? And this is where the collaborative interdisciplinary approach needs to occur. And I think public health can have a huge piece of, um, of promoting the fact that the care is there, we just have to make the connection to it. Um, we have an infancy program. This is a big uh, public health initiative that the AOA has done for years. Any child up to 12 months of age can have a free eye exam, comprehensive eye exam with a doctor of optometry. They just have to go to the website, find the doctor in their area and, and get signed up. And I've done that for years and it's it's wonderful because you not only make sure that things are great with the child or not great, we find a lot of problems, but you also help the family and the stakeholders understand the value of eye health and eye care. And then the last one is um, enhancing public health capacities to support vision related activities. So in partnership, not only from a national perspective, but with areas like your within the state, we have you know, the state HHS and we have national uh, or the Nebraska Optometric Association and a lot of stakeholders that I think you've already um, built upon that can certainly take this and run forward with it. Um, the vision care section of the APHA is, is in, that's a, a group I've been involved in with for years, is very dedicated to helping from the top down um, get information and help to get um, 
resolutions and awareness at the national level as well. So they're working on our behalf too. And then helping to make I envision healthy environments. And I think this is really a, a key part of what you and what we as healthcare providers need to do with our state and local health professionals, our departments, our agencies, not only national, but local to um, minimize the impacts of vision impairment. And if we can do that at the determinant level, and we can do that at the primary and preventive level, then we will have accomplished a huge, a huge, uh, a huge objective. Um, and we talked about EHB and for time, I'm not gonna go into that anymore, but I just wanna remind you that that was a huge win for us from a healthcare perspective, because it did push into the upstream primary care um, embedding of this as an essential health benefit for kids. So um, I want to, with that, I want to thank you for listening and let you know that um, this is kind of our take home is, you know, if we don't care, nothing's going to get better. And if nobody takes any action, we won't be able to make any progress. And the fact that you're all here is very encouraging. And it's um, a, an honor for me to be able to share some of that with you. And with that being said, I'm going to minimize my screen and see if you have any questions and I can turn it, I guess, Sandra, you can take it back over and we can have some discussion or dialogue. And I hope that that was uh, clear and I didn't go too fast. So thanks for listening, everybody. No, thank you, Lori, that, that was great. Um, I'll, I will just pause for a second and ask if there are any questions and remind folks that you can either raise your hand, I will unmute you, or you can use your chat function um, and I can read the question for you. But thank you, Lori. This is a great connection between vision and eye health um, and how it relates to public health. Um, I'll give folks just a second here to kind of um, percolate some um, questions. This and is, as a, oh, go ahead. This is Susan. I have a question. <laughs> um, I was, Lori, I was. Um, Wondering about, well, I had a couple of questions, but one of the things that I was wondering about was the infancy um, program that you mentioned. Is that a national program? And it may be that our health departments are aware of this and it's, and it's old news to them, but I just had not heard about it. If you, And I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about it and how we would determine if um, an optometrist is per participating in that in a local community. Yeah, I will tell you from the AOA perspective, and then I'll let Dave tell you if there's any um, additions to that from your state and local perspective. Um, but the it is a national program. It is in every state in the country. You basically go to infancy online, and I want to say it's at AOA.org forward slash infancy. I know there's a link there. Um, and if you search under infancy and Google, it'll come up and you can have, it's a doctor locator system. So you find, a, um, you tell them where you're at, you can punch in a zip code and tell them how many miles away, I believe. And it'll tell you what doctors in your area are providers, are participating providers, and it gives you their contact information. And you really don't have any screening at all. This is basically a, we'll give you the name, we'll make the contact, the parent, the, the caretaker, whoever it is, can call that doctor, get the appointment scheduled, and take the child in. And this has been going on for years, and it's it's been incredibly effective. I mean, you've seen the videos of these small infants getting glasses. Just simple, We say simple things. They're not necessarily simple, but the treatment of spectacles is often thought of as a, oh, yeah, we'll give them glasses. And having their entire world change, you know, smiling when they look at their parents' faces and being able to process that information they need because the visual system continues to develop even through 7, 10, 12, 15 years of age. So um, that's it, it's an important thing. We've also picked up retinoblastomas and saved lives, and there's a lot of things that go on in healthcare. But m more commonly, we, we can make sure that things are developing and functioning the way they should be. Dave, do you have... Anything to add to that from the Nebraska state perspective? Um, just one thing I'd amplify with. I mean, uh, just and just to clarify, the, there's a specific website for that. That's infancy.org okay. um, that should get you to the place that Dr. Grover is talking about. And then we certainly have infancy providers spread across Nebraska 
sort of along the same lines, one other resource that I want to make sure and make people aware of is that Nebraska is one of the states that also has a comprehensive statewide public service program for three-year-olds. Um, that was another age group that Dr. Grover was referencing in her presentation from three to five years old. There's a program called See to Learn um, that we sponsor and support in Nebraska. Many of our doctors across the state participate in that. And again, it's a it's a free um, exam for any three-year-old. There are no income or, or, or other qualifications. Um, and information on that is available through the website c2learn.com. Um, and it functions much as Infant C does, where you can get matched up through the doctor or locator with um, uh, find a doctor that is part of the Seed to Learn program, um, and it will it will facilitate getting get getting you scheduled for an appointment. So we would welcome the help of the the public health world to help promote awareness of both of those programs. We're in. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's great. Okay, I am actually going to unmute um, Michelle Beaver, she's a director at, um, a health director at South Heartland District Health Department. Michelle, do you have audio? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, I, I just checked out the infant C. I didn't know about that. Thank you very much. And I see that within, within um, 50 miles of Hastings, Nebraska, which is in South Central Nebraska, we have um, 10 providers that participate, but the nearest one is actually within 25 miles and there's just one. So it's a, it's a distance for folks, but I'm glad to know about that. And I'll also look um, into the C to Learn program to see who's, who's um, participating in that. Excellent. Are there any other questions um, for Lori? Um, this is Michelle, if I might follow up on um, something else. You mentioned that uh, maybe 60% of your patients are not um, children. I think it was that, it was at the order. And um, we have not really done a lot ourselves with um, with the, the pediatric or, or child um, population, except for maybe promoting um, eye safety around um, 4th of July or, or sun safety actually with kids, a lot of uh, sun safety um, prevention. Um, for, for eyes and skin. and um, But we do work with our seniors quite a bit um, with fall prevention and the vision vision mm. screening there and promoting that and wondered if there were some recommendations or um, uh, national initiatives around that vision for seniors. Yes, and I, uh, this is going to sound a little self-serving, but I have a website and I have a blog that I have been contributing to and a month or two ago, I did a posting on embedding eye health into fall prevention. Um, and um, I gathered, it, because there had been a new, I, there was some new clinical information that had come out and I started seeing primary care now recognizing eye and vision health as an important component for fall risk prevention. So I'm going to make a plug and I'm totally above board of being honest with you. If, if you go to eye health, net.com e-y-e-h-e-l-t-h-n-e-t.com um, that's my website and there's a blog posting um, that talks about eye health and fall risk prevention the references in that posting re um, will point you to the cdc study program it's s-t-e-a-d-i yep we use that you know that one and then it's also some information about um you know from the, uh, the american optometric association and i would also point you to the adult eye and vision examination guideline this clinical practice guideline um i see patients of all ages with vision impairment there are some eye doctors that only focus on children that only do pediatric visual impairment and there are some people that focus only on the older population or um but it, it's it's a 60 40 55 45 65 35 depending on the time of the year i guess um <laughs> and and what's happening usually in the voc rehab um uh, funding arena so you know the kids will come in early in the year and then when when the bureau for vision impairment or whatever your state uh, vision um component is named when their funds 
kind of are in hold or dry up, then we stop seeing the kids so much. But like in Ohio, it was Bureau for Children and Maternal Health, and we used to see them through that way, and then we'd see them through BSVI, or we'd see them through Commission for the Blind in Michigan. So there's all these different ways that we see them. So the population will differ a little bit, but um, the primary care, the primary and preventive upstream part of that, whether it's for older adults at risk or whether it's for children, really is much broader. So I just want to um, make sure that that, that point is, is well taken is that there's really not anybody that shouldn't be examined because if we know that you know, if we know you don't have any risk factors and we know things are good, then we'll know how long to let you go again. And the problem is we can't do that unless we examine. And same with adults, um, you know, their risk for their age-related risk for for um, all sorts of problems related to vision is very great. So um, that's kind of a long-winded answer to get you specific information on falls and risk. But I think that um, some of those resources can be helpful. And if you need anything else, you can always send me a note or email me and I'll try and point you in the right direction. Thank you so much. Sure, thanks. Okay, um, if there are um, no burning questions at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jason Kirkman from the Department of Health and Human Services in our injury prevention program. Jason, do you have audio? I hope so, can you hear me? Yes. All right. So um, thanks, um, Dr. Grover. This is very good information. And thanks for um, Nalid for putting all this together. But um, I wanted to take just a few brief minutes to kind of tell you what's been going on here at the State Public Health Department related to vision and eye health. Um, we have one quick slide up here. And what happened here is um, DHHS, we received a grant from the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, and I believe their funding came through the CDC. Um, and with that grant, um, we were able to do some data collecting and then also engage some stakeholders and look at their activities. So um, our data collection, what we did with the uh, Burfus, um survey, we um, were able to include the six questions related to vision health. I believe most of those are kind of the older adult range and not so much in the, in the children, but um, we have two paths. And we started that beginning um, January 2018, uh, we we're, were able to do that through this whole year and get those two questions. And that information is being collected now. Um, we had the grant last year and we were able to collect data for the 2017 calendar year. And that data is currently being um, analyzed and we should have that available sometime mid to late summer. Um, we did some brief data collection for the 2016 calendar year. And um, we were able to take that data and we did develop two fact sheets that you'll find on our DHHS website. And for those of you that have been familiar with it, sometimes hard to find, but um, we don't have a short URL, but it's under the public health. If you go under program and services under health promotion down at the bottom, um, you'll see vision and eye health. It's it's out there or email directly me and I can uh, get you those, those fact sheets. And then another area of screening and some data we were able to gather as Lori has talked about, you know, the, the schools have mandatory screenings, they do. And so through conversations here at the state level with Carol Tucker and um, her her role as the health nurse or school nurse coordinator, she um, reached out to the schools across the state and asked them to voluntarily um, send in their information, results of their visual screenings. Um, I believe there are about 250 school districts in Nebraska and 55 of the school districts did submit their information from their health screenings. Um, right now, we're just, we have it, we just have to find a way to get it analyzed and looked at. So we're, we're looking at that, so that was a big win. And then the other thing we did, as, as you've heard, is we did contract with NALID to do the, the statewide um, questionnaire and survey to the local health departments and one of the federally qualified health centers. And that survey they did was a 15 question survey and was based on eight of the 10 essential public health services. The, uh, the two services we didn't um, uh, attempt to look at was the number six enforcement of law and regulations and number 10 research for new insights. But the other eight were covered in that survey. And for those of you that are on the call that took the survey, thank you very much. We are using that information. So we appreciate that. Um, and then we had a few phone calls with some of the, the stakeholders out there, some of the organizations that are doing some of the activities. Um, some of those that were on the call were Children's Hospital Medical Center in Omaha, the um, Building Healthy Futures um, 
organization, the Nebraska Optometric Association. And if I forget anyone, I apologize, um, but thank you for those that have participated in the call. And through those calls, um, we were able to attend the Nebraska Children's Vision Summit just a few weeks ago, and that was very informative for us. And then um, the new mobile eye health van that is coming out of Omaha, which is a, a collaboration between Children's, I think the Building Healthy Futures, I also think the Nebraska Optometry Association is a part of that. Again, if I miss someone, I apologize. Um, so we're gonna help promote that, um, hopefully get some just kind of state media on it. And then the other um, thing we're looking at doing and to continue is just to see where we can um, connect and, and promote the activities. And this year we found out through the Preventive Health Services Block Grant, we'll have $25,000 um, around there that we can dedicate the next fiscal Block Grant year, which starts October 1 through September of 19 and dedicate it to some of this eye health um, initiative and public health going on in Nebraska. The key with the, the, the block grant funding is the Healthy People 2020 objectives. There's They have five or six related to eye health and we have to stick within those. So we have to find the right fit with the right partners. And um, a few of you may be hearing from me for ideas on how we can make that work. So that's kind of a quick overview of what's been happening in the state, I would say the last 12 months or so with vision and eye health. So any questions? That's great. Thank you, Jason, for explaining that. Um, I don't see any questions at this point coming in. Again, raise your hand. I can unmute you. Um, we're a pretty small, intimate group today. Um, use the chat function, um, and I'll, I'll be monitoring that as we go on. We have about nine minutes left, and I just wanted to make sure, too, that we hear from some of the local health departments on the phone or on the webinar today about how they are incorporating vision and eye health within their public health activities and foundational areas. Um, so let's see here. We have Tiffany Hansen. We haven't heard from you um, at this point, so I'm gonna unmute you and see if we can have some audio. Tiffany, do can you, you hear have me? audio? Yes, we can, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so we do some kind of neat things here in our little health department. We, one of our local doctors, Dr. Fett, she works um, predominantly in South Sioux City. She is um, very focused on eye health education and uh, as are a lot of optometrists. And so she has been really passionate and connected with us. And so we're able to get a lot of referrals, especially related to chronic conditions and chronic diseases. So she refers her patients over to our health education series, which focus a lot on um, pre-diabetes and diabetes management. So their six series session, and one of the sessions focuses on complications due to those conditions. And so probably about an hour of those sessions are around um, eye health and different things. And then Dr. Fett will come in and talk about how, what impacts um, diabetes has to eye health and eye care, how important it is to take care of yourselves and routine eye exams and things to that nature. So we just started really this um, this year since January working with their office and it's been really great. Patients are really receptive to it. She's really enjoyed it. And so we're hoping to really expand on that program and encourage some, some better screening and some better education around um, our eye health. That is fantastic, and I, I was um, I did not introduce Tiffany Hansen. She's with the Dakota County um, Health Department, which is in the northeast corner of our state. Um, but that sounds like um, some great activities that you're doing, and a good integration between clinical and public health. Um, so thank you for sharing, Tiffany. Are there any questions? Um, otherwise, I'll move on to Michelle Beaver again from South Heartland. Michelle, it looks like you're self-muted. There we go. Yeah. Can you hear me? There we go. We can hear you. Yes. Um, hi. I'm not sure I have a lot more to add. I mentioned that we have, are doing some um, um, promotion of, of eye health um, with our um, population and that we have been working with older adults as well and um, study program and um, 
uh, also a stepping on program is one that's um, part of our uh, tied with our Tai Chi programs across the state. Um, and then the other thing that we're involved with some is that we have a, a minority diabetes uh, management um, program. And so part of that is, is getting folks in to see um, uh, vision specialists and make sure that their eye health is is um, maintained as well. And so in our role in, in public health is providing community health workers to help with that translation um, and interpretation for, for vision services. Um, so those are the primary things that we've been doing. So I'm really excited to be exposed to some of the national initiatives and, and a look at some ways that we can um, promote more than, more than we are currently doing. Many of our health fairs um, involve some sort of um, vision, whether it's the, um, the um, uh, sheriff's office may be doing the little, little vision screening, screening, quote unquote screening, um, or um, we, we had a group that had um, um, special equipment so they could look for the amblyopia for kids and um, uh, that's not currently happening but we've had some things like that but I'm excited to see how we can maybe um, partner and um, align more with some of the national initiatives so I appreciate your um, your um, presentation here Dr. Grover. That's great. Thank you, Michelle, for um, sharing. I'll just ask anybody else that's on the webinar if you want to share um, about the efforts that you're doing um, between clinical and public health integration or vision and eye health and public health. Um, just to raise your hand again and I can unmute you. Um, and as we have maybe someone here or not, I'm going to pass it back to Steve McBride. He has a few other resources that he wanted to make sure that everybody knew about. So, um, Dave, you're on. Okay, thanks. Um, just real quickly, I wanted to make sure and mention one other resource in addition to the public service programs we talked about briefly earlier. <clears throat> Our organization has partnered since 2000 with the Nebraska Foundation for Children's Vision, which by its name uh, deals exclusively with resources having to do with vision care for, for children. And the, re the, the website for that foundation I think would be worthwhile for all of you to at least be aware of. It's nechildrensvision.org. That's NE like in Nebraska, not the word NE. So just nechildrensvision.org. There are <clears throat> links to a number of different organizations that are that do work in this area and have that are stakeholders in this. Uh, there are various forms that are available that can be used by schools, nurses, etc. There are a variety of educational materials um, that are available, some that you can order, some that you can just download and use uh, for promoting awareness of, of vision and the connection with vision and learning. Um, there are a couple of resources on there for low-income families in need of vision exams um, and several other just promotional items that could be displayed or or used in public health fairs and, and things like that. So um, that website hopefully will be um, a, a useful resource for you and wanted to make sure that everybody had that. That's great. I just sent out the, the website in the chat function so you all should um, have that on your screen too for um, that website. So thank you for sharing that, Dave. Um, I will, I do want to mention that this webinar is being recorded. We archive it on our YouTube channel. So once that's all finished, um, converted and uploaded, I will be sure to send this out to all the participants and feel free to share among your networks as well. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in the chat function. No hands are going up. Um, to volunteer um, any questions. So I think not seeing any other questions, I'm going to end the webinar. But I do want to thank uh, Dr. Grover, Dave McBride, Jason Kirkman, and um, our local health departments for sharing today on this webinar. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks very much. Thank you.